Hello, hello, welcome to a fresh episode of Mota Wave Noise. My guest today is a lawyer, an entrepreneur, a musician, a poet. She wears a number of hats. We will talk to her about law, entrepreneurship, our declining music industry, and expressing your pain in poetry. Expressing your pain in poetry. My guest is Nur Pandiwala. Nur, what's up? Hi, thank you so much for having me. Thank you for coming. So, Nur, you uh, trained to become a lawyer, but then when you came back to Pakistan, you came to be practice law. So, if you could just tell us about your journey, preparing for law school, going to law school, and then coming back and you know, work as an entrepreneur, pursuing music, poetry. So, just walk us through your journey. So, um, in getting into law school, I mean, I guess I could start from there. Uh, I, I was 18, and when I was applying to university, like all of us, and to be honest, I had no idea what I wanted. I had absolutely no clue. Um, I come from a family of lawyers, so I was like, okay, might as well the natural choice, yeah. see what happens. So I applied and I, I, I after I got an unconditional offer, so I didn't really think twice about it. I was like, great, I'm in university, let's do this. And, and this was so ass. This was so ass in London. Um, so I went to law school and uh, I was there for three years. And I think... Uh, I mean, not to, not to kind of say that this wasn't for me or this is for me, but during my degree, I, I always kind of felt like, okay, maybe I should be doing something else. Um, and half of it's where I really, really questioned it. Not to say that law isn't beneficial. I mean, it, it's honestly been useful to me almost every day of my working life now. Um, but I think I was always kind of looking for something else. So when graduation time came around, I was always like, okay, now, now what? You know, now what's the next step going to be? And I have two older siblings. So I would speak to them and be like, you know, what did you guys do? How do I approach this? And they're both lawyers. Yeah, they're both lawyers as well. So they kind of had like a straight path, right? And for me, I was really, really confused. Uh, and it, I came back and I told myself, I was like, you know what? I don't think I want to practice because... I didn't, by the end of it, I decided, okay, you know, that's not what I want to do. And I, I told myself, whatever opportunity comes in my way, I'm just going to take it. I'm just going to see where it goes. And yeah, it's uh, that's kind of how I've been weighing it since then, and it's worked out really well. And you now work as an entrepreneur. You have your own brand. Just tell us about your brand. What do you guys do? So uh, we uh, basically run a brand called Spasalon. Uh, it's a Sri Lankan franchise and I brought it to Pakistan in 2019 with my mom and we're actually half quarter Sri Lankan ourselves uh, so it's very close to home and uh, so we sell luxury Ayurveda wellness products which is things for, from like hair care, body care, facial care and we have a store at the mall and aside from that uh, my mom's actually been running the main guy for I think it's been about 14 to 15 years in Karachi so I work in the management sector of that organization. So. Okay. So now we spoke about you as a person you said. And yeah. the one thing that I noticed in the past maybe 10 years is that when I was growing up in the early 2000s, we had a huge music scene in Karachi. And we'd have concerts all the time. Yeah. There was a proliferation of all these music channels. So we would say MTV, IM. And now you actually see that now. And I think this shift, this shift happened around 2008, 9 when we had like, all these topics across Pakistan, and everyone who used to watch music can shift to those channels all of a sudden. And now, even though like, you have some deal like Ocean's like Hassan Hakeem, but we don't really have big stars that we have. So, for example, we don't have stars like Strings or maybe for, for that matter, Vital Science. You know. So, what do you think about that? Do, do you think that this is true? Like, do you think the music industry has declined? Is it on the right once again? So, with the music industry, I mean, I've been playing music since I was like in the sixth, seventh grade. Um, I picked up the guitar and we're done. And um, I remember I, I used to have friends who were musicians in school as well. And all the way going into O levels, into A levels, being in Karachi, we used to we used to crave doing gigs. We just didn't get enough opportunities to do them. We didn't have enough places to play at. And I think that's probably around the same time that you're identifying with the frequency of it kind of went down. But I, I feel like maybe it's for a variety of reasons. I think safety is the biggest one. I feel like in terms of the music industry rising or declining, I feel like it's it, it's it's kind of like a double 
edged coin. Uh, I forget the term, but double edged sword. Double edged sword, maybe. Um, because I mean, Spotify is here now. That's something huge for Pakistan, right? But at the same time, I don't feel as if there are a lot of on ground, local, home growing communities for artists. Um, it's almost difficult if you're not already involved in the art scene to kind of embed yourself in it. So I feel like I feel like we need to do more to cultivate local artists and kind of keep them keep them relevant, keep them moving, upgrading onto the next level as an artist as well. And when you were growing up, who were your influences in general music? So I uh, I was actually like hard, I still am hardcore rock and roll fan. So I love like the signs, I love strings, I still love strings. Um talking about like international artists, Red Hot Chili Peppers, love them. So a lot of rock influences, I would say. And actually when we did play, I mean in school and in like inter school gigs, we do a lot of rock music. Okay. Yeah. And you had this conversation a few minutes ago about you uh, and Panda Free started by. Yes. So tell us about that. How did that happen and how was your experience working with him? So um funny story actually. Uh so he actually sang the song at my father's wedding when okay. I my mom. And years later, I don't even know how they kind of got in contact again, but my father wanted him to perform at my brother's wedding. So I called him up and he actually remembered us because he sang a Sri Lankan song for oh, yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. And so he was just around and they were having these meetings, deciding how like events would go. And I was just like, can you uh, coach me while you're here? And he was like, yeah, sure. So he gave me like a good two, three lessons in person and then the other five um, online. Yeah. I don't know. He's, I, first of all, like he's such a big name, but he's the nicest person you'll ever meet. Like you will, I was expecting to be intimidated, but he's so warm and so humble. Um, so that was lovely. And I think I learned a lot even from my few classes with him. It was just amazing being in his presence. And he's, I mean, his voice, he still sings like a bird. He has, a powerful, powerful voice, and I think he can hold any audience even at his age now. Yeah. Yeah, so it was phenomenal. It was a very cool experience in my life. And do you think, uh, so are you being trained by somebody else? Or else? This yes, so okay. we have a vocal coach based in Karachi. His name is Abdullah Okay. Uh, and he's great as well. I think he's really like made me, he really grinds me hard in terms of my vocal coaching. So, yeah. Okay. By the way, the first time I heard about you was last year. I remember, and most people who live in Karachi remember that, you know, Karachi is completely wrecked by these rains last year. Mm-hmm. And you would have formed a pretty really popular instantly. Yeah. So how did that happen? So, uh, as I said, we managed to name that, right? Yeah. So what had happened actually that day is we were getting ready to go to work to somebody else in the city. And uh, much of our staff were already in the salon or were on their way, way to work. And suddenly it started pouring down and everyone was stranded. And you know, always like the feeling of helplessness I had, because you work with these people every day, right? And we couldn't even go out there and get them because my car had broken down. There was no way that we could help anyone that we cared about. So I remember feeling this desolate kind of feeling of, oh my gosh, there's nothing I can do. So I wrote, which is the one thing I could have done. And it was strange because I was literally sitting in my room and I, I, I wrote this poem and I put it up and it was maybe, it took me out of maybe under three hours. And then I put it up and my phone just started going crazy. I did not know what was happening. I was super, super freaked out. I was like, this is new. And the response I got, it, it was, I mean, obviously I was really happy that people liked my work, but I was also just like, this is collective grief, what's going on right now. And so yeah, it kind of just happened, maybe almost by accident. I don't know, what maybe it was the universe, but yeah, that's how it happened. And that's, it was a fun fact, like there's this lawyer I follow on Twitter, and his Twitter bio says that inside every lawyer is the record of grief. So, is the record of grief? Yeah. Okay. So <laughs> I, I, I find that really interesting every time I look at that bio. And you know, that just brings me to my next point. You spoke about poetry as well, and you've seen that poets throughout our history. So, for example, people like Peirsa, yeah. they express their agony in their poetry. So, for example, a lot of people don't know that when he wrote this, it was in Hopper, he was in Mama. This was when he you know, lived in Pakistan and he realized that this country was not what he had denied it to be. Yeah. 
And a lot of people like we expect our poets to always have the right kind of weapons. And with everything that's been happening around us, you know, an escalation of violence and violence against women, do you think it's easy? Are you grateful for your poetry or for your ability to find words? Because it's really a challenge of pain. But do you think there's also a pressure where people think that you will have the right words? People like you want to be with people. I feel I've never actually come across the feeling of numbness. I think if I have, it's only maybe been temporary, but that's, and I think that's partly just because I, I'm the kind of person that if I do something, I need to vocalize it, otherwise I won't be processed, right? So I think maybe that's where my, my poetry kind of comes from. I wouldn't say it really, especially with uh, the case with the movie that just happened. I mean, uh, I believe you saw my live, and yeah. that's how you contacted me. But I actually took like a good two weeks to get around to writing something like that. Because I think in terms of expressing specifically towards violence against women, I think now is a time where no woman really feels safe in Pakistan. Um, what I am grateful for is that I can play my part in a small way of putting words to a feeling that maybe some people can't do. Um, so yeah, I wouldn't say it's easy, but I would say maybe that's just my way of expressing what I feel and now probably what most women feel. Yeah. And yeah. you have this conversation a while back that you went to Savas to look, try to feel lost when you came back yes. to Pakistan. And you also half to London. So mm -hmm. for you, like, what does it mean to be a Pakistan? And was there, like, was there any doubt when you came back to Pakistan? Or do you sometimes feel like this is you know, so for example, on social media, we have people all the time so that they want to escape this country. Yeah. And you can't blame them with everything that's been happening around, especially as a woman, for example, you, when something like this happens and you see people at the main stadium, like while well, maybe these things are happening because it's something close to them. Yeah. Or for example, when the motorway incident happened, there's a police chief in the hall said that you should have left the past that. Uh -huh. And when you see, and I, I we, we had this conversation a while back as well, that you often feel let down by the state, even when it rains, for example, in Karachi. When there's violence against women. So, was there a part, is there a part of that regrets coming back to Pakistan? So, about your question about what it means to be Pakistani, I've actually had this conversation with a lot of friends, and what we find is that we're almost going through like a national identity crisis. I don't think anybody really knows what that means, unfortunately. I feel like it was hard maybe coming back to Pakistan because. But not really because I've grown up here, like this is my home. But I mean, I was in London for three years and coming back was definitely an adjustment. It wasn't the easiest thing. And about being let down by the state, yes, there is true. And not trying to diminish anyone's pain or anything like that. But I feel like if we don't keep a positive outlook on given challenges, we aren't going to move forward. So whenever I... I mean, I, I feel disturbed and let down by the things going on in our government and in our country. Um, but at the same time, if you kind of look at it through another lens, for example, there are more women in the workforce than when my mom was my age. So I feel like, yes, there is a lot of bad, but there's also a lot of silent good um, that maybe doesn't come to the forefront of the news often. And I feel like, some days it might be hard to be a woman in Pakistan, which maybe will catch me in moments where I'm like, oh my gosh, I regret this. But as a whole, I, I really don't. Because my family's here, that's a huge thing for me. I want to be close to them. Um, but And at the same time, I feel like maybe us young Pakistanis that are privileged enough to have an education and be aware of these things, we are the ones who are needed to help out. Otherwise, it's going to stay the same. So I feel like having a positive outlook in terms of growth of and then going out of this challenge, as long as that may take, I think it's important for us to have that and not be not let all the negativity get to you. That's and as you said, that things happen. So I remember one of my friends after the news said that. All these incidents have been happening since forever, like, and she said that my mom said that yeah. you know, back in the day we'd be grown, we'd be what we would be would talk about it as much. Yeah. But now I guess the one good thing that's happened with social media and everything is that people do talk about it. 
Yes, yes. And there's obviously like there are a number of women who still don't have the courage to speak out. Of course, like the women who do speak out are a, a small percentage yeah. in Pakistan in comparison with those who don't. True. But yeah. I guess it's still that people ask if they are. We now we at least having these conversations that we can have that in. Yes, yes. So I, I think it's definitely something. Yeah. Yeah. And okay, so we initially when we started off, we talked about how you were a of these hacks and you were not at the do you at some point like see yourself dropping everything and pursuing zero only or a pursuing full time only? Or do you think like all these things made you who you are? As something, you know, going back to what you asked me like in the beginning about figuring out what you want to study in university and then figuring out what you want to do after university. I feel like I feel like we live in a world of specialization and that kind of bothers me. Yeah. Because I, I believe in the idea of a renaissance person. I feel like human beings, everyone has something about them that makes them special. And that applies to everyone that we meet. I was also very careful this notion, like you want to fit in a certain category. Yeah, whereas, I mean, you're a lawyer and you're doing podcasts. So why is that a problem, you know? So I feel like it is very much possible to do a lot of things. I think it just... It comes down to how you manage your time and how badly you want to do everything um, to, to do the things that you want to do, sorry. But I, I I don't see myself devoting myself solely to one thing because there are just a lot of things that I want. Uh, so, yeah. But in terms of like devoting myself to music, I am currently working on my EP. Okay. Um, so I have like, I'm planning on releasing it. It has like four songs before the end of this year. Okay. And I've actually you mentioned the motorway case. So I wrote a song about that. Oh, that's really good. Last year, then I released in October. Got interesting uh, reviews, but I was happy that I got it out there. Yeah. Yeah. And speaking of music, are there any kind of artists that they do just show you really like interested in? I really like Natasha Milan. Okay, yeah. yeah. yeah she was my senior at now. She was actually um doing her masters at SOAS when I was in my okay. last year. Okay. So we hung out a little bit. I mean, I saw her on campus, but I always thought she was super cool. And anybody else? Uh, <laughs> nobody's coming to mind right now, but um, in, in terms of some continental music, I love Lisa Misha, she okay. wrote it. Um, I think those would be my two top in the subcontinent, but right now, not coming to mind. Yeah. Also, what do you think about like all these? So, for example, and there was like Coke Studio, Nest in the Basement, Bio Sound Studio. Mm -hmm. Do you think they're really helping a music industry? Because there are some people who think that they, they, they're probably not helping the music industry as much because they're still cover, they're primarily covering old sound. Like, there's not a lot of new music that's coming out. While some people think that they're still giving a platform to people, to musicians, people may not know about this much. So, for example, a number of people mm -hmm. may not have known Dustin Rathalani before Bio, right? Yeah. So, like, what, where do you stand with this? I feel like it's amazing that we have platforms and I think I think they're doing a good job in their own right. And I will say this because I'm not actively involved in the industry, so I'm not by no means an industry expert. Um, but I do feel like a lot of these uh, endeavors are powered by corporates. Um, Most of them actually. I think all of them actually, yeah. 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 Um, and I, I think it's difficult to kind of get independent artists and different material out there when it's a corporate thing like this. Artistic and creative freedom is always going to be limited, right? It's funny like, because yeah. at Coke Studio, mm -hmm. uh, there was the song that they got, like, I'm taking you by the Yes. And you know, everybody was saying that I'm taking you by stands against everything that Coke Studio is saying. But it's funny how they were, you know, carrying that song. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's true. But I, I think we need more independent organizations to come in. Uh, I think there's a lot of scope for it because we have had a lot of talent. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I like to, that's something I would really like to see more. Yeah. So, in terms of future plans, we spoke about uh, like your know, EPD. Yeah. What other plans do you have for this year, the next year? Um, I, I don't even sound like you know, those uncles you made a party. You made an RTX. No, but I feel like. You know, if people ask plans, I think COVID kind of threw everyone's five year plan down the drain. Um, so I have very short term goals. Uh, I would say I keep writing, write a lot more poetry. There's a lot actually that I haven't put out there that I have written that I intend to. Um, 
keeping music, maybe when COVID kind of hopefully, I don't know, normalizes do more gigs because I miss playing live. Um, so yeah. yeah, I think that's an, another thing that I go my business. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, we know that you paint as well, not so much. I, I used to paint. Yeah. I, Any I plans of doing that again? Um, maybe, I don't know, I haven't in a very, very long time, but I used to love doing it in school, so let's see. Okay. Let's see. And just before we like end this conversation, mm-hmm. do you want to sing something for people who are watching us? The same something? Yeah. What would you want me to sing? The song that, like something we do, upcoming EP. <laughs> okay. Let me think about this. Hmm, which one should I say? So there's one song, I can sing the chorus for you. Yeah, okay. Uh, it's like a jazz blues swing song. Okay. Okay. Okay, let's do this. I have no instruments, nothing. <clears throat> no thanks, I'm cool, I won't be made a fool. I'd rather sit on my own than come and dance with you. I know you're kind, honey, you think I'm blind, but I'll be damned if I leave my heart. With you. That was beautiful. That's an exclusive. I have not put that out there yet. So this is the French look of the song. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> pretty much. Thank you so much for coming today. Thank you for having me. This was such a lovely conversation. Same here. Pleasure is all mine. So today we spoke about music. We spoke about food.